And I want to make sure that you know that Pear here sponsored this fine little event. Two years later, broke Joe's record. It took a while. I mean, it, it probably took more determination than one could imagine to even conceptualize the project. But Art Thompson here was part of the Redwood Stratus mission, and he was technical project director. Uh, he also managed the flight test program, which included uh, creating and designing the pressurized capsule that uh, Felix Baumgartner used. Uh, they set some incredible records. They went to Joe went to 102, 8,000, 102,800 feet. Stratus mission went to 127,852 feet. You know, the distinction there, maybe in our mind, is, oh, wow, it's a long ago. 24,000 The reality is, this is a very dangerous thing. What Joe did in his day was ultra dangerous. What Art Thompson and his group did was still ultra dangerous, but with more modern computerized equipment, which we all know how well computers work, right? <laughs> now, Art is also, you know, credited for designing and building the world's largest paper airplane. At some point, we're going to ask some questions about that one. But the thing was 45 and a half feet long, 24 foot wingspan, and it flew just under a mile. And it reached speeds of 98 miles an hour. That's not a bad paper airplane. I wish I had one when I was in the third grade. <laughs> That's probably where it started, right? <laughs> but he's also got 40 years in the aerospace industry. He's come up with some very innovative designs that have been used in many, many applications. And they've set some major milestones and worked on the YouTube's self armor project as well. And uh, I'm going to let, I'm let uh, actually, and I, let me tell you a little bit about Alan too, because these guys you guys are going to go back and forth with some questions and answers that I think you're going to find interesting. Now, Alan, in 2014, worked on the Stratex team, and they set the latest record at 135,889 feet. And they're talking about the longest street at 123,334 feet. And he did it not from a capsule, but a specially designed 500 pound spacesuit that they suspended underneath uh, a specialized one. But let's let these guys talk about, I'd like to hear about the challenges that you had to face, Art, during your project. I want you to maybe list a couple of the challenges and how you managed to get past it all. So, one of the things, you know, you got to hand it to Joe for what he did. Because what Alan and I worked on when we started with the Rebel Stratus, we already had an idea that it could be accomplished. And Joe's time, he was tasked to um, see can man survive at altitude if we wanted to go a space program. Um, and so what is really amazing, and I know I'm supposed to talk about Stratus, but what's really amazing about Joe that he is the first pre-astronaut. You know, the president was like, can man survive at altitude? We want to do a space program, put people in space. <laughs> so, uh, when you look at what Joe did, the, the guys, the younger guys on the ground rooting Joe on for his success, there were people who were no-name people like Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin. These were the guys on the ground, you know, amazed. And when you walk around with us in any kind of event where you see all the Apollo people, they revered Joe as the next level up because he was the guy. And for me, on Red Bull Stratos, it was important for me to get people to remember who started this because um, when rockets were being shot off, everybody forgot about the uh, staff, Joe, the learning program. They kind of laid the groundwork for where all this started. Um, and so it was important for us to have Joe's mission control, the guy in communication with Felix, uh, 
helping Todd feel it through it. The which was a huge challenge. <laughs> Felix and I have remained friends over the years, which we say is probably one of the most amazing things. Uh, is in Felix's program, we used to refer to him as the ass set. Uh, and Felix loves that, actually, because he does like being a little bit of a girl and being a guy. He kind of, was kind of our diva. Um, but he drove a lot of, you know, he complained about everything throughout the program, which made us take it to another level, which was great because in the end, NASA and the Air Force really respected that we took it beyond what they would do. So we shared a lot of the technology back that ended up going back into like the U2 and high altitude egress for trying to save people's lives. And that's one of the things we're really proud of because a lot of pressurization into aerospace uh, to stop the compression sickness and things like that. So Joe was in an open basket, a uh, very small budget because the Air Force didn't want to spend a lot of money. So he was full exposure all the way up in an open basket. Um, he was in a newly designed space suit, Michael Strauss, uh, when I had, uh, Felix first contacted me in 2005. He said, our Dino Joe Kittinger it's like, yeah, I know what Joe is. He says, well, if you were going to break Joe's record, how would you do it? It's like, well, Felix, it's 3.30 in the morning in Austria, so why don't you go back to sleep, and I'll think about it with all you in the morning. So I ended up writing an 87-page proposal on how to break Joe's record using a pressurized capsule instead um, of an open basket, um, American spacesuits, and... Uh, redundant balloons, American balloons, uh, which was part of our big challenge because we're the only company, our little company, um, Sage Cheshire, we're, you know, uh, 15, 20 people. It's a very small organization. We're the only company to buy spacesuits. Um, and American balloons, you know, they don't want to sell you balloons because it makes NASA look bad when they do what they haven't done. And so NASA intentionally blocked us from buying balloons. And so we went around the corner and I knew the guy who was running the Italian uh, space division. The guy was out of Colorado and I said, I'm going to give you a lot of money and you're going to buy balloons for the Italian space program. And we're going to meet in the forest in Colorado on June so two weeks after that, because they had actually canceled our purchase orders from Raven Aerostar. Two weeks after that, uh, uh, Jim, the vice president of uh, Raven Aerostar, called and said, you know, Art, I know you don't have any of our balloons, but remember you were going to put us on your insurance policy. Can we still get this on your policy? Problem at all, and get you on the policy. Is there anything else you need? He says, No, that was it. So it was one of those things. Same thing with the spacesuits when you spend a million, eight hundred thousand dollars on three spacesuits and redesign the configuration, tailor them down, fit the position. And then after you're making three spacesuits for them to say, Oh, and by the way, it doesn't come with the hardware. And the company that makes the hardware only sells to NASA and the Air Force. So back to the Air Force Surgeon General, Tom Travis, who they were very interested in seeing what we came up with because they got the benefit of our technology. And I said, Tom, you know, we want to get hardware for our suit. They approved, went back to the company. They said, we've got all the approval. They said, only one problem. The people who know how to make the hardware were laid off 20 years ago. But we'll bring them back and they can train us how to make the hardware. The other problem is it takes nine months for certification. So I went back to Tom Travis, the Air Force Surgeon General, and said, we will trade you our beautiful, brand new hardware in exchange for your old, rebuilt hardware that we can use right now. And so we did an exchange. So along the way, um, huge challenges. The FAA um, was fought us on what the FAR numbers were and, and uh, what you know how we're taking somebody up in a man balloon somewhere outside of 
their airspace, you're going to exit out of a balloon. And so it seemed pretty obvious. You go up on one farm number and you come down on two other farm numbers. A parachute, it's an unmanned balloon on the way down. But they fought us and said, you're not going to fly. And fortunately, Joe's good friends with uh, Congressman Micah, who is on the FAA Oversight Committee. And so after arguing nine months with the FAA on the farm numbers and technicalities, I've got trucks on the road taking balloon equipment and personnel and capsules and spacesuits over to Roswell, and uh, the FAA is telling me, Mr. Thompson, you are not going to fly. And I said, Peggy, we'll see about that. And so when we called John Micah, I explained, John, we've got ex astronauts on the program, we've got three spacesuits, this is a serious science program, this isn't a Red Bull stunt, we're actually bringing science to NASA and the Air Force, they want this data, they need this data, we're trying to show how does a man egress at altitude in the stratosphere um, without using a drogue uh, in free fall. That was, we, we had developed the safety equipment, the drogue equipment, the anti-spin devices, but the key was to try and do this from altitude without utilizing the safety equipment to see if it was possible. And uh, Congressman Micah calls Peggy up at the FAA and then later calls me up and says, Mr. Thompson, Peggy's ready to talk to you. So after that conversation, um, talking to Peggy and the head of the FISDO office and everybody else, um, they were like, we'll do whatever it takes, we understand, and it'll be three different far numbers. And after that, I called Joe and I said, Joe, it's an amazing thing because I can still smell burning flesh over the phone. <laughs> So needless to say, they came back and said, uh, uh, when they came out to give us our approval, they said uh, uh, that they had called the space division to ask you know, what they should look for in the capsule. And they said that uh, NASA down in Florida said, you know, Mr. Thompson has the top team. They know exactly what needs to be done with the space design and life support. And so whatever he says goes. So I said, so you're here for the tour? And he says, yes, and it's on your paperwork. <laughs> it does kind of give you an idea of the headaches that they have to go through to get this stuff done. I mean, I, I work in the military side of personnel parachuting, and we're constantly being requested to do stuff and we need the data to support it, which costs a lot of money. These guys spend millions to do this stuff. Yeah. But uh, it begs the question, when Alan did his jump a couple of years later, now obviously, Alan, your, your spacesuit, because you did not jump from a capsule, you basically created a capsule spacesuit that you, with arms and legs, right? And you climbed into that baby. What you got to tell us how that whole conceptual thing came about because I got to tell you, I worked for one of the companies that developed the parachute system that you use, and I knew nothing about it. We are talking, if anybody knows, is Bill Booth in the room? Where is that guy? Where is he? Oh, he'll be here tomorrow. Let me tell you. If Bill Booth knows about anything, so will the rest of the world shortly thereafter. How they kept that project secret, I will never know. And I'm not going to ask anybody to divulge that secret either, because I've been working for Bill since the 80s. But now, how and why did you guys go the route you went with that spacesuit instead of a capsule? Uh, so, uh... I'm a pilot, I'm an engineer, and a skydiver, and, uh... You know, for me, I was trying to understand, uh, I read everything, I read all of Joe's, you know, uh, books, uh, I, he had been a hero of mine since, I mean, you know, if you're a skydiver, you know, Joe's a hero, you know, he, he did it at a time when no one else had even thought about it. And, uh, and the whole thing was a secret, no one knew for a long time afterward what he'd actually done, and so, I had always thought about this project, just like I'm sure everybody else had thought about, you know, going to high altitude. 
and what's the highest you could ever skydive. So that was always a dream of mine. And then I was actually reading about the Red Bull uh, Stratus effort, and uh, they had this beautiful capsule, and it is the Rolls Royce of capsules. I mean, I've, I've spent time in it, it's funny, even after my jump, I've got a picture of me in the capsule, which I'm, I'm hoping he doesn't post because my team will probably shoot me. But it's a Rolls Royce, it's pressurized, it's heated, it's got, I mean, it looks like, like a shuttle cockpit, it's got like switches everywhere and things. Uh, but for me, the question was, well, I'm in a spacesuit anyway. Um, I had read about the issues with capsules, like Joe's, Joe had an issue getting out of the capsule, set off that uh, timer, went into a spin. I, you were probably one of the first people ever saved by an AAD, because they developed that AAD, I think, for your program, didn't they, or around that time? A little bit, little bit before the time. So anyway, so getting out of the capsule is hard. Um, uh, it's heavy, which means you need a lot bigger balloon. And uh, also, there's, there's issues when you leave the capsule, you only have a small amount of oxygen, you know, maybe 15 minutes of oxygen, which means if you don't get down in a hurry, then you can die just by not having. So a premature opening of a reserve, which, you know, is a bad day for all of us, and 20 bucks, or now probably 50 bucks now, uh, to get it, <laughs> is, that's what you have. But there you die. So in Phoenix's case, he, he had the ability to cut away a reserve, which, you know, he had multiple cutaway systems. I'm sure there's a story there somewhere, which I won't bring up, but uh, anyway, they have, uh, but, but that's what they did. And I said, well, what happens if you do something more like scuba diving, where you just have the suit on, and it's capable of making you survive for three or four hours, or five or six hours? Then I don't have to worry about cutting away the reserve. If the uh, you know, shoot opens early, I've got plenty of time. And so, you know, for me, it was just scuba diving and skydiving kind of mixed together and so that's what we did and uh, you know it was not super sure it was going to be possible so we had to solve a lot of problems along the way uh, but it was inspired because uh, Art and I are both engineers and you know every time we look at something I mean everybody else can just look at something and look away but we're out we're looking at something it's like man I've got to have a better way to do that there's got to be a better way to do that and so that's what inspired it is just uh, actually looking at the amazing capsule looking at the amazing program and saying could we do it in a simpler way and of course it took a lot longer it was a lot harder we need a much bigger team a lot of different things uh, but I must say that many of the, the path for us was paved by both of these two uh, we had elected to go with a drogue when uh, we saw Felix spinning like a top. He was he was in an inverted flat spin at over Mach 1, and he managed to get out of that. So kudos to Felix. But you know our our uh, flight profile had to guarantee that I could get safely on the ground, even if I was unconscious. So we weren't depending on skydiving ability. We were depending on engineering to do it. And that could have happened too. I think your safety system would have actually done that as well. Matter of fact, uh, uh, Luke Aikens had actually helped with the design of their safety system and backup system. And we flew up and talked to Luke and he actually gave us some hints that were really important. Because in Joe's case, you know, that dummy would, that you uh, use spun at 200 RPM. But our dummy that we set off at 120,000 feet would have been predicted to, to spin at 400 RPM if we did not have uh, a drogue system. So anyway, so we, uh, we came up with a drogue system. We came up with a, with a new way to deploy a drogue that guarantees the drogue is effective early, but it's impossible to entangle the way that Joe did. Uh, and uh, so we built a lot of systems and uh, took us three years start to finish, and, uh, which is another thing that amazes me when I look back on Joe's project is just how few people were involved and just how quickly they put the whole program together. Um, so anyway, so uh, you know, we, we we did have a beautiful, ingenious design. Blicky's uh, from UPT uh, put that together. Uh, it's an amazing system. And uh, but anyway, so that you know, that's what uh, uh, that's what we did. We we did three jumps. It's funny. Your first jump was at 70, but we were too scared to go to 70, so we went to 57,000 feet. Was our first jump. And uh, then we went to 105, and then we went to you know 135. We had trouble. We had trouble getting balloons. We ended up having to go to India to TFR to get balloons 
uh, because we didn't know about this sweetheart deal that where <laughs> balloons are hanging out in the forest in Colorado. <laughs> and, uh, and then in the FAA, uh, it was actually really relatively straightforward for us to go through the FAA because you had already done it once before. And we actually had a really good relationship with the FAA. But there was a moment, uh, you know, before our first jump that said, wait a minute, you're going up as a, as a hydrogen balloon pilot, but as far as I can tell, you have no control over that balloon, which is true. <laughs> We said, no, I do have control over that balloon, you know, I, uh, I have the, uh, I, I can yell down at them to take, to, to, you know, to basically drop ballast. We have a vent on the balloon that I can yell down, and even more importantly, I have a cutaway. So if I want the balloon to go up faster, I can pull this thing. <laughs> and so I am a pilot in command, and we're good. And they bought that, and so... Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, no, no, we, we had about five and a half hours of total oxygen there, but anyway, so uh, the jump of well, the, the, the amazing thing of all of us, I think, understand is for a project like that, it's really the team that you build, and the attitude of that team, and also, all of us had problems in our jump. Yeah, is there a hint there? <laughs> See, Joe just gets things done, you know? <laughs> it's like all of a sudden a beer will appear in his hand. Good God, I love this guy. Uh, anyway, so uh, the team makes it all work, and uh, I want to thank an amazing team that, uh, that helped us to put the whole thing together. Now, while Joe's working on his second one, has anybody got you guys in any of them? <laughs> A few more beers over here, because I've got some more questions. The altitude? Uh, you know, balloon flight altitudes. So on our, we did two unmanned flights, first just to test our equipment. Our first manned flight was to 72,000 feet. So you're above the Armstrong line, where there's not enough pressure to hold the gas in suspension. The second flight, we intentionally picked a balloon that would keep us below 100,000 feet uh, for our second flight because we didn't want to break Joe's record on the second flight, but we did want to break the Russians' record. So the Russians had a record of 87,000 feet, so that was very intentional. Um, and I do want to comment about Alan's drove was amazing. And the really easy way to visualize what it is, is think about a tape measure, okay? Tape measure, you pull the tape out, except his tape measure was a carbon fiber strip that would snap around the lines as the drogue pulled out, and it would keep that like a pencil. If you held onto a broomstick, and the parachute's on the end of that broomstick, it can never wrap around you. So it's a Incredible design. I just it's a roller tube, yeah. I mean it was really brilliant. And when we saw that, you know, we were like, Darn you Alan for you know and then when we saw the drogue, it was like, okay, that was pretty cool. I, I know there's some I got more questions, but uh, maybe you have a good one that we haven't thought of yet. Yes, sir. Hey, Joe, my name is Pierre. Uh, did you get jump bay on those jumps? Now, Joe was recruited by Colonel Stapp of uh, Wright Patterson, uh, their aerospace uh, division, and they were like the, they were they were tasked by Washington D.C. to say, "Hey, we got jet pilots going to 80, 90 thousand feet plus. What happens if they have to bail out of that aircraft?" And that's the impetus of Joe's program to start from, which was the beginning of the space space program because they're jumping from the edge of space. And it was his job, right? <laughs> now, you guys were working on from the private sector. Okay, now, who tasked you, Art, to, to work this thing through? Who paid for this whole thing? Well, Red Bull, probably, but they paid for the whole thing? So, 
So, um, Rebel Stratos, obviously, I told a little bit about Felix saying, you know, can you, you know, break Joe's record? Um, so, Red Bull was obviously the funding source. Um, the nice thing about Red Bull is it's owned by one person, so you just got to convince that one guy. You know, not a board of directors, not a big group of stockholders. And, uh, but it took two years. Because it wasn't until the end of 2007 and answering questions for two years straight that they finally said, you know what, we want to do this. And so we, um, I had bid the job at uh, $10,500,000 for the technical side. There's a lot of more to it with the production and all the other stuff. Red Bull says they spent $27 million. Um, so it was ten million five. million which, you know, people ask the question, and I don't mind sharing that. Uh, but Red Bull interfered for a year with the program, and I said, you're going to learn a really painful lesson. <laughs> so uh, leave the flight test to the flight test people. And it cost them an extra million dollars, roughly, and uh, another year and a half worth of time for the program. Um, but in the end, that $11.5 million investment, Red Bull got three point nine billion dollar return on investment. So their their sales went up. Uh, in the United States they sell about five billion dollars worth of product in the US alone. And their sales went up about twenty percent. Um, so anybody who says that the, that the marketing can't drive things, I really believe that one of the big things is about the best thing about Red Bull Stratos in my opinion was the inspiration of the kids. Really, STEM education. We had millions and millions of kids who now want to be engineers, um, they want to be flight tests, um, they want to be astronauts. So it really drove the education up, you know, a little less gaming, a little bit more flight science. Um, it inspired people for parachuting. Uh, so in the industry all around the aerospace, it was huge for the kids. So that, to me, that's one of the best things that it did. Um, but what it really showed is that um, governments don't want to fund big science programs yeah, I get one of the so the money. And so by going to a private entity and having them understand that there's a monetary marketing benefit back to them, that in the end, we took the data we learned from Red Bull Stratus for pressurizing our capsule. We, we pressurized the capsule to 8 psi, so 16,000 feet. Um, so Felix's entire flight, if he had a problem or freaked out halfway through, he could open up the mask and breathe what was in the capsule. We would just bring him down um, because he had been, would be contaminated by the nitrogen in that air. Uh, but the data that we got out of that, we turned around and put into the U-2, um, raised the pressurization in the U-2 cabin uh, from the equivalent of 22,500 feet to, um, we pressurized it to eight and a half, so it was 15,000 feet, which stopped decompression sickness for U-2 pilots. Um, the reefing system we use, and the balloon system, is now something that they use with the Air Force, so there are a lot of benefits. But... All right, so, so Joe had marching orders from the military to get on board and get up there. You had a commercial backer, Alan. What the hell were you thinking, son, to keep up with that crap? Uh, so I was fortunate that I uh, joined Google in 2002. Uh, and so uh, it was a very good time to join Google. Uh, I managed uh, engineering for from 2005 to 2012. And then, uh, and this project started in 2011. And so, uh, so, and we, we thought it was gonna be pretty cheap actually to do it because we had this new idea of just getting a spacesuit and a balloon and we thought it would take a year and not very much money. And uh, that turned out not to be true. <laughs> turned out to be a harder problem for lots of different reasons. I mean, just getting a spacesuit is hard. And they were able to use a Dave Clark uh, suit, which is which, uh, um, uh, which is great, but we actually needed something that we could be pressurized in the entire time, you know. So we needed environmental protection from the time we went up to the time we came down, and um, 
And I think Dave Clark might have been able to do that too, but I'll see Dover is what uh, it built our spacesuit, and they're the ones that do all the EVAs, you know, the extra vehicle activity, the Apollo suits and all that, which turned out to be a good match for us, and uh, they were really good to us and put in a lot of work in the program. Uh, but anyway, in, in the end, I, uh, I decided to fund it myself. Uh, I think Google would have actually funded it. Um, but the problem with external funding is you, you don't get to control everything. And we were really worried about, or I was personally worried uh, about media and how my, that might affect the program. And in some ways, I mean, these guys did an amazing job with the engineering, but if you look at the day of that launch, I mean, they had a worldwide live stream with billions of people watching it. They had, what, 700 reporters on site that day. I mean, it was, an, it was a zoo. And, um, and I was afraid that that level of attention would distract us. And so, and it turned out, you know, we had a really bad jump, one that we actually learned a lot. Another way to say it is a learning experience. Um, and that one mistake, I mean, it wasn't, and nobody died or anything like that. There wasn't any injuries, but like, the, the system did not function as we expected it to. And it caused us to go back and spend a year redesigning basically every system um, based on that. And uh, if I had had an external sponsor, I would have been begging cup in hand to do that. But since it was me and I was funding it, uh, I could make a trade-off and say, yeah, it was worth it to me to have the added safety. So in the end, uh, in the end, uh, I think uh, self-funding worked well. It was money that I didn't really earn. There's no way that you could have earned that in some way. And, uh, and it was something that we, we really enjoyed. Uh, it, uh, the team was wonderful. And, you know, there was lots of things in the program, just like the, uh, the Stratos thing that, you know, were first that had never happened before. Like, it was the highest pressurized, I mean, it's the highest pressurization of any suit. We pressurized to 5.4, uh, which helped us with DCS first, uh, you know, drove deployment the way that we did it. Um, and our spin system uh, was uh, was new at the time that we had used. Um, you know, the, uh, the way that we had uh, uh, launch balloons was very different than anybody had done. We used a static launch system. Uh, so we, we, there was like 10 or 12 different things that we had done that hadn't been done before. Uh, and so we learned a lot. So anyway, in the end, it was worth it. I don't know whether uh, my, my wife is the only person that knows the total, and she reminds me of it all the time, but uh, <laughs> I'm not going to tell. I'd just like to carry on a little bit what Clark said about Red Bull. They were a great sponsor. An absolutely great sponsor. And the reason was because it's a one man operation. And that one man wanted it done. The one man was the president. And we never had to go back and fight for anything. If we needed funds for something, we got it immediately. They were a great sponsor. Now, I hear you guys talking about concept to jump the time it took, and it sounds like, uh, Mark, you guys, from from the, the day you got the phone call to the day the record jump was made, how many years, days, months? Well, we started conceptualizing in 2005. They said go in, it was December 2007, so we'll call it 2008. So uh, in 2010, when we are going for final um, manned rating on our capsule in San Antonio. That's when Felix had his breakdown. Uh, so that pushed uh, the capsule test to 2011, uh, which we used uh, Rob Rowe in between that, who was the chief test pilot for the U-2, uh, put him in the capsule and man rated the capsule and did all that. Uh, so there was a year downtime, and then the final jump was 2012, October 2012. So. Yeah, so 2008 to 9, 10, one year off, uh, 11, 12. So it was a five-year program. For me, it was seven years. And I have to admit, you know, you got to count the downtime because there's a reason there's downtime. Okay, whether it be technological, financing, or some other glitch, all right? So about seven years, eight years? Well, well it, was, it was five years. 
five year program. Yeah. Now, Joe, from concept, when Colonel Staff asked you into his office and told you what he needed until you made your record setting jump, how long? 18 months. <laughs> Uh, something you said about the military getting stuff done. And if you read Joe's book, you know they did it on a shoestring budget. Yeah. How many jumps? Joe, how many parachute jumps do you have before you made that record setting jump? It's my 33rd jump. Yeah, I got it. Joe. Yeah. <laughs> Remember, I was not there as a skydiver, I was there as a pilot and an astronaut. And they are not skydivers, so they, they didn't want me to have a lot of jumps because I was assessing equipment for people that, would, that were not skydivers. That's right, dude. exactly. We got a question? Yeah. DK, I want to know what happened to the balloons after you guys left? Ah, that's a very good question. Matter of fact, that was one of my questions. So uh, let's, let's take it from Joe first because he did it first and he left that capsule. After, I, after we jumped, all of us, they sent a signal from the ground and would cut the balloon away and the balloon would we'd fall down from altitude. Okay, so it was a very simple thing. We just cut it, sent the signal and then had a square and it would fire and raise the balloon. Okay, thank you. So did you get that? Cut it away? So you, you everybody retrieved balloons? So in ours, our balloon, Joe's balloon, to get him to 102,800 feet, was a three million cubic foot balloon, pretty good size. Uh, to get to 128,000 feet, it's a 30 million cubic foot balloon. So our balloon on launch was 600 feet tall, and the parachute hanging below that was 150 foot, that was roofed down to 17 foot, so we could control the drop zone and the capsule, from 26 mile diameter down to one mile diameter and reduce the time and drop and fall from an hour and a half to about 20 minutes. So our flight train was 750 feet tall. Uh, the rocket that took Apollo to the moon was 368 feet. So our balloon was the largest manned balloon. At altitude, when it's inflated into its bubble, it's 380 feet across, so it's bigger than a football field. Um, Alan, he had other challenges. Yeah, so uh, it's an interesting question because that's that falls in the class of things that you think are going to be easy that turn out to be really hard. Some things you think are going to be really hard turn out to be really easy. But the, the problem is almost everybody up to that point had had two ways to get, you need two ways to get a balloon down. The FAA requires two ways to get a balloon down. And generally, use a vent is one of the ways. And then some way to rip a big hole in the in the in the uh, balloon. And they had a they had a 3,000 pound weight to drop, but I didn't have anything to drop. So we had something that was like 28 pounds that was trying to rip the balloon. But we had one other problem is is that um, the balloon when I left flipped over, and so the uh, so when you were supposed to rip it top to bottom, you really ripped it bottom to bottom. And so on one of our jumps, our balloon, uh, you know, was a runaway balloon, and we didn't have a transponder at the time, so now we're chasing this balloon all over, you know, North America, and it's, I mean, it was one of the smaller balloons, but it was still, it was still big enough to get the attention of the FAA. Um, but the other thing is vents don't work, because the delta pressure inside and outside the balloon is basically zero. So you can, we had a vent that was like six feet wide and open by a foot, and nothing happened, you know? And so in the, in the end, we ended up experimenting with, um, with detonation tape on the top. So we had to, we, and by the way, detonation tape by itself doesn't work, so it's got an oxidizer in it, but it's not enough of an oxidizer at that altitude. So then we had to put a specially reflective tape on top of it to heat it up. And then we had a second row of detonation tape that when you got lower, you would explode. But we were worried that we would end up solving the getting a balloon down, and then we have this flaming balloon coming down over Texas. So there's always trade-offs. But in the end, we had to use all four systems to get that balloon down. So uh, anyway, but and you know, like like Joe said, it's big. I mean, it weighs a thousand pounds. It's just for reference because I was a lot smaller. We um, 
they had a, they had the largest man balloon ever done. I mean, 28 million cubic feet. Mine was much smaller. It was 11 million cubic feet, but that's still the size of a football stadium. And uh, and, and you know, mine was a thousand pounds. Yours was probably double that coming down. So, 4,000 pounds coming down anywhere in Texas. So one of the reasons that Roswell is such a good place is there's nothing to hit, or certainly nothing valuable to hit. <laughs> Let's put it that way. <laughs> All right, how, how heavy was uh, your capsule? The boom, Felix was 3,400 with the capsule, uh, with the rig, with balance, with everything. Um, uh, and the balloon itself was about 3,700. And Joe, is your, yours at 4,000, you said? So it came right on down. Yeah, gondola? Yeah. 700 pounds. Ah, so he did have to have a, a much larger envelope, yeah. So one, thing, one thing that's really interesting, Red Bull is big on media, right, because they need the marketing, is that we had allocated a 500 pound weight limit for the camera system, and when all was said and done, there were 1,500 pounds. So they blew the weight on the cameras. So that, that 3,400 pounds included 1,500 pounds of camera equipment, which we probably could have gone without because the uh, the GoPros that we used that I bought at Best Buy um, actually have some of the best, if you watch the video footage, the best footage there is the GoPro footage of him in free fall. We had two cameras on each leg, one up, one down, one on the chest pack, um, and then we had one that the balloon crew attached to the top of the capsule. So we had these thirty, forty thousand dollar red cameras that were in those big pods. And when we went to red, we said, "Okay, so will these work at altitude?" We, they said, "We can tell you without a doubt, our cameras definitely won't work <laughs> because the electronics in it, the capacitors, are the type that would explode at altitude. So we had to make pressurized." canisters to hold these $40,000 cameras, there's three of them, then you had, uh, we had the, the cannons and the high-speed video and all this stuff, and in the end, the $300 GoPro was just amazing, and we made our own altitude chamber, tested it down to 100, minus 110 degrees Fahrenheit, and up to uh, 220,000 foot altitude, and they worked great. Wow. You got any more questions for these gentlemen? <coughs> Colonel Joe, the, uh, the connection to Roswell and the alien phenomenon seems to be started with you and the Stargazer Project. I was wondering if you could somehow elaborate on how that whole, <laughs> that whole thing started with you and the, and the Stargazer Project. Anybody have beer in the back of that? I can definitely go pick it up now. We're going to make that short, Joe. we got some more shuffling. If I told you, I'd have to shoot you. <laughs> That's how you stay on schedule. <laughs> I tell you what, I want to thank these gentlemen for being here because uh, since Joe made his jump and 54 years later when Alan did his, and 52 years later when, when Art and that project went up, these guys have done more to contribute to safe travel through space for our astronauts, developing new new data that they can use to develop better equipment. And I think we need to give these guys a big round of applause. I want to let you know that in 30 minutes we got a book signing going on. Joe's going to be signing his book and we have a, Dan B.C. will be here, and Jackie Smith with her book, and Norm Olson. So come on back in about 30 minutes if you can partake in the book signing. And I want to make sure that you know that Pierre Gear sponsored this fine little event.